Hi! In the past year, I've released a platform minigame, a 3D walking sim, and a pong level. Do you know what they all have in common? That's right! Hundreds of hours wasted for a few thousand downloads! I am so mad! Also, controls. Controls? Yes, controls. Player controls is a thing that most minigame creators get wrong, which is ironic, considering that the game only has two buttons. The likely reason is that trigger interactions are a mess, and detecting the two button presses reliably takes a monstrous system. So, allow me to show you how to make the ultimate minigame controls. Hey, pst, subscribe. This took hours of my life that I'm never getting back. First, we need to set up the level. Set it to mini, double, and two-player mode. Set the speed to 0.5, that will help you later. Okay, now put a block with a D-block at the bottom, add them to group 4, and lock them to player X for eternity. Put a wave portal for the bottom player, and add some slopes in a D-block to make sure it can't get out. Don't think about the top player for now. Alright, the player's aside, but now we have these dendroff-looking things. Don't think about it, just add a cube portal at the top after the wave portal. Now the ground modes. Not to worry, just add a portal to a group, move it down, then use a move trigger at the beginning of the level to move it back up. That works, don't ask. Alright, now let's get to reading the player motion as trigger input. Add two collision blocks at the bottom, add both to group 4, scale down the bottom one and set it to a new group. Then set up a follow player Y trigger for it. Important! Use the right trigger, if you use the move trigger the entire system will break! Alrighty, set the player collider ID to 1 and the upper collider ID to 2. <sighs> the setup is complete. Now let's take a second to talk about triggers. GD triggers are basically an SLANG esoteric programming language, and some coding principles can be applied here. God, what am I doing with my life? Introducing functional decomposition. What is that? Well, functional decomposition is a method of analysis that dissects a complex process in order to examine its individual elements. Okay, that made things harder, so let's just stick to triggers. The main issue is that top layer input can only be detected using touch triggers and the bottom collision triggers, which are two different systems, and using them both at the same time is about as enjoyable as organ failure. So why don't we use another system that would represent the output of both systems in a similar way, and then use that system to deal with our controls? That's what I meant by functional decomposition, by the way. I know this is a little confusing, stay with me. In a second it will make a lot more sense. Please welcome the most underrated thing in the game, counters. Counters are incredibly versatile and can be used to do all sorts of things, including our controls. So, add a zero delay spawn trigger at the very beginning, set it to spawn group 3. Add two counters, C1 for the left button, C2 for the right. Set them both to group 4 for testing purposes. Now add two collision triggers, spawn triggered and multi-triggered, add them to group 3. You still with me? Good, because this is where the fun begins. Set the first collision trigger to detect the intersection of blocks 1 and 2. Set the trigger to activate a pickup trigger with a value of 1 for the first counter. Do the same for the second collision trigger, except make it trigger an exit and activate another pickup trigger that subtracts from the first counter. Ta-da! Now the first counter is basically a boolean representing the state of the left button. Alright, home stretch. Duplicate the pickup triggers, change them to the second counter, and give them new groups. Add two touch triggers, both spawn triggered and multi triggered, group 3, then set the first one to activate the plus one pickup trigger, tick the toggle on, hold mode, and dual mode checkboxes. Do the same for the second, except set it to toggle off and set its target group to the subtraction trigger. Phew, that's it. Now both of our buttons are represented using counters. But Nemo, why would we even need that? Shh. Counters are awesome, because now that we have the two variables for the buttons, it takes just a few seconds to set up any controls you want. The idea is that any combination of the two inputs is represented by the values of the two counters. Here's a very common example from my 3D engines. Suppose we have a player that should rotate left and right using corresponding buttons, but if both of them are pressed at the same time, it should move forward without rotating. The hard part comes from making sure that any state transitions work as expected. For example, if you're moving forward and you release the left button, you should rotate right instead of stopping dead in your tracks. Here's a transition diagram that describes how different input changes should affect the motion of the player. Now, let's do it using triggers. First, we need to detect any change in the values of the counters. So we need four count triggers, each for zero and one values of each of the counters, and they should all call the same group. Then, using instant count, we can call a group for any pair of values of counters one and two. That is the most efficient way of doing it, even though it doesn't seem to be at the first glance. Look at how beautiful this trigger group is. It might seem large, but consider the fact that it creates complicated character controls that are intuitive to use and completely bug-proof. Creating something as responsive not using counters is a twisted method of torture. Hey look, it's asteroids! Knowing this technique, it becomes much easier to create controls tailored to any minigame, from Pong to a 3D labyrinth. Please, for the love of God, use this, it will make your life so much easier. If you don't want to make your own version, it's fine. I will have this level uploaded to my account with a copy option. With that said, Nemo out.